I just love the endings in some of the letters in the New Testament. If you remember back last week when we finished 1 Timothy, got to the end of that letter, uh, you'll, you'll notice that often the endings of letters are just great words of encouragement, uh, often just motivating us to persevere and to endure. So, for example, he, he has some other endings from some of the letters in the New Testament. So Romans, the great book of Romans, ends in chapter 16 like this. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. How's that for a victory that's coming? The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. And now to him who is able to strengthen you according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's how Romans ends. First Corinthians ends like this. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. I love this part. Act like men. <laughs> Be strong. It's really stealing us to strengthen ourselves. And this is the ends of letters as we go into our lives. These are the endings of letters. Galatians ends like this. Chapter 6. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. You might remember the ending of the book of Ephesians is the whole armor of God thing. To stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Now one of my favorite endings of the letters in the New Testament is from the book of 1 Peter. And I think the ending in 1 Peter is, is such a substantial source of encouragement to us because the whole book actually focuses on suffering. And in the letter of 1 Peter, uh, he, he gives us um, just all the various sources of suffering that we can expect to face in the Christian life. There's many different sources of it. And Peter actually lists those. So let, let me uh, give you a highlight, if it were, of some of the sources of suffering that we can expect to face as Christians. So right in the beginning, uh, he speaks about when we are to be subject, it, the household codes, you've been paying attention to First Timothy. He says, you, you might suffer because of that. He says, for this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. So that's a source of suffering. In chapter 3, he'll talk about suffering that comes from doing good. He'll say, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. And in chapter 4, he'll talk about the suffering that comes in particular when we are trying to struggle against our own sinfulness. This is not external suffering, but internal. Chapter 4 verse 1. So since Christ suffered in the flesh, you also arm yourselves with the same attitude because the one who has suffered in the flesh has finished with sin. In later in chapter 4, he'll talk about the suffering that comes through just living your life as a Christian, trying to remain distinct. They say, with respect to this, they, the world around you, are surprised when you don't join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. So you will suffer because of that, but they will give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. Later in chapter 4, he'll talk about suffering that comes specifically now from God to refine our faith. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. You'll talk about suffering that comes due to active persecution against Christians. Verse 14, of chapter 4. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, well, you are blessed, going back to Ariel's little moment with the Beatitudes. You're blessed even if you're insulted because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And then right at the beginning of the book, kind of as he introduces this letter, as he introduces the subject of suffering that he'll track through throughout the letter, he'll kind of describe it in a general sense by saying, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. And I think we can include the pandemic under the category of various trials. So the letter opens with this tone of suffering and we're going to see at the end of the letter closing on dealing with this issue of suffering. But before, as he closes it out, one last source of suffering that Peter's going to deal with that we're going to have to deal with today and that is suffering that comes from 
our adversary, a very real enemy, the devil. So we're going to have a look at that. But it's not the main emphasis for today because it's actually not the main emphasis of this closing passage in First Peter. The main emphasis of this closing passage is what happens after you have suffered. And doesn't that just sound good? Can we just pause there and just say, doesn't it sound good to think about after suffering, to think about the suffering being over? Do you want to hear about that? Do you want to hear about what comes after you have suffered? Whatever source of suffering you might be going through now, there's that whole long list that I just read to you. Whatever source of suffering you are enduring right now, isn't it good that we're going to talk about what comes after you have suffered. And what comes after is beautiful and filled with hope. So here is the Apostle Peter's last word on suffering. And it comes in 1 Peter chapter 5, right at the end, verses 6 to 11. Let's read together. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, Strengthen and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. In case you haven't realized it by now, there is much opposition in the Christian life. That's why we call it a fight. That's why you cannot coast. In Christianity. Coasting in Christianity leads to the slow fade of faith that we were challenged with in chapter 4 of 1st Timothy. The Christian life, in living the Christian life, you will face much opposition. And we can kind of categorize those sources of opposition into three main areas. You, you will face opposition from the world around you. World views, people, philosophies. You'll face opposition from the world around you. You will face opposition from your flesh, what's inside of us. Struggle against sin. So opposition from outside, opposition from inside, and what we see in this passage, and I think what we already know, is there is opposition that comes in the form of a diabolical spiritual opponent known as the devil, and he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's what we just read, which sounds very hectic, doesn't it? And yes, yes, it is hectic. But you should not be afraid. This is the constant word in the Bible on the subject of the devil. This is what the Bible will tell us about the devil whenever it deals with the subject. Yes, he is real. Yes, he is powerful. Yes, he is dead set against us. But you do not need to be afraid. So you should not be surprised at opposition that comes from the devil. You should not be intimidated at opposition that comes from the devil. You should not be timid in the face of opposition that comes from the devil. You should certainly not run away 
due to opposition that comes from the devil. You should resist him. Stand against him. Firm in your faith. That is all. That's the instruction all over the Bible when it comes to the subject of the devil. As it's summarized here at the end of 1 Peter, resist him. It's real, but you know what? Just resist him firm in your faith. The warnings in the Bible, the warnings for us, the warnings about the devil are not there to scare us. We're not meant to be afraid. And there's a good reason for that. It's not just because fear is debilitating, that, although that's true. It's actually because if you fear something without realizing it, sometimes you're actually reverencing them or it. For example, you know, at high school, we had this guy, man, we had a few of these kinds of guys, the school in the south of Joburg that I came from. If you, you know, like the real... Bullies of the school, hectic guys. I mean, there was one guy in particular, and uh, I'm not going to mention his name, just in case he's listening. As you can tell, I'm still, there's still some fear here, right? But it was especially just really just ran the school, terminated everybody through use of force and power. I'm sure he was double the age that he was meant to be at school. And everybody kind of spoke in hushed, hushed tones about this guy. And when he like walked past, we would point him out and go, there's, let's just call him Bob. There's no one scary ever. It's named Bob, right? But you know, people spoke about him. There was this reverence given to him. I remember like early, like grade eight, being that's, that's the guy. Like you need to watch out for that guy. It's like there was this fear, but actually behind it, there was a sense of awe and reverence for him that, that's why the Bible doesn't want us to be afraid it never speaks about the devil in terms that we should be afraid because in fear you're giving some sense of awe and reverence don't do that doesn't deserve any of that it's real powerful set against us but you should not be afraid resist him stand firm in your faith that's the summary of the Bible when it comes to the subject of the devil. And that's about all the airtime that I want to give to that subject this morning. Because what I do want to get to is what comes after that reminder. And that, comes, that is about what comes after we have suffered. So let's read that part again. And after you have suffered a little while. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. This is really where I want to focus this morning. This verse is one of those underline worthy verses. If you're willing to make notes in your Bible, to highlight, this should definitely be one of those. It's one that you can memorize. And apply to whatever suffering you're going through. And I really mean that. I think this word on suffering functions as a summary, a summary encouragement to any kind of suffering that we're going through. Now here, at the end of 1 Peter, is, comes right after speaking about suffering that comes through the opposition from the devil. But remember the whole letter has the theme of suffering woven through it. So this is the last word on all that suffering. And Peter is referencing subjects like eternal glory that he mentioned at the beginning of the letter. I'm telling you all of this so that you can know when you look at this one verse, this functions as a summary statement for any of those kinds of suffering that we're going through. And it's a beautiful statement filled with hope. So let's just walk through it really slowly. First, notice. The suffering is temporary. It says, after you have suffered a little while. The suffering is temporary. Whatever the source is, 
It's temporary. Now, that, of course, could mean that it's going to be over soon. Like now, like whatever you're going through, the hope here is that that could end today, tomorrow, next week. We might get an announcement from the president tonight going, the pandemic has disappeared from us and it's over. I don't think we're going to get that, but that seems to be, that's part of what we can expect here is that it's temporary. It will end. But it could also mean, after you have suffered a little while, it could also mean that even if your suffering extends through the course of your earthly life, right to the end, compared to the eternal glory, which is referenced here, we're meant to be thinking eternal glory. So this could also mean even if your suffering is prolonged through the course of your life compared to the eternal glory, it's a little while. Now let's think about this for a moment because I know that last part that's supposed to be encouraging often doesn't land with some encouragement. It's almost like we've got to figure out which of these two could it be the little while? Does it refer to it's going to end like now and we can expect all of our suffering to end now? Or does it only mean later? Which one? And it seems this is one of the great tensions of the Bible. The Bible will often do this to us and it can be so frustrating. For example, subject of healing related to a lot of people's suffering, especially now. I mean, we are praying so much for people who are sick, obviously. And when we pray for people who are sick, like you're praying for people who are sick, we're praying, believing that God can heal them now. And there's word in Scripture to pray like that, to pray and expect that God can heal people now, and we'll see that. But we also know that the Bible speaks about final, full healing one day, that instant healing won't come to everybody. We've prayed for many people in this church who have still passed. But we've also prayed for people in this church who have miraculously recovered. And the Bible will tell us both of these things. In some instances, we'll pray and they'll be healed. But in sometimes their final healing is in eternity, in eternal glory. We've said farewell just recently to saints who are resting in eternal glory. And that is final, full healing. The Bible gives us both of those pictures. It also, in the subject of our sinfulness, referenced earlier in 1 Peter, we're supposed to struggle against our sin and suffer, literally strive so hard to deal with it that it hurts, believing that actually we can put stuff behind us. That some of our temptations, some of our habits, some of our addictions, some of our brokenness can actually be behind us while we're still alive. The Bible talks about that, the hope of being rid of aspects of sin that haunt us, that torment us. There's hope now, but then the Bible will also speak about eternity one day when only really then will we fully be made perfect, resurrected in these eternal bodies that are perfect, never to be stained with sin again. It'll give us both of these pictures. And the Bible will do this with suffering. It'll tell us a little while and may not be too specific if we should expect that to end now or at the very least one day in eternity. So my question is, as I've wrestled with this, it's like, why would the Bible do this? Why would it give us both? Like, if it's going to tell us it could be over now, a little while means today, all your problems will be gone. But actually, it could mean, no, 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 eternity. Like, why even tell us today? Why give false hope? You know, just tell us it's later. And at least we can prepare ourselves. But why does the Bible give us these two things? Well, there's a really good reason that we are supposed to see both of these together in tension. We're supposed to have the sense of, yes, definitely in eternity, Suffering will be over. Yes, we're supposed to believe that, but we're also supposed to be even possibly now, tomorrow, it could be over. And we're supposed to have those two things together because it gives us two things, two great gifts this tension gives us. One, it gives us the gift of hope, ultimate hope. 
Like this idea of eternal glory, of the knowledge that one day it's all gone. It, the gift is of this ultimate hope. But also, the second gift is it keeps us, this tension, keeps us prayerfully engaged in the present tense battle. Let me explain it like this. Let's say, for example, all we had in the Bible was this one side, this one encouragement. Hey, one day it's all going to be over. As a Christian, as you believed in Jesus Christ, as you've been saved and reconciled to God, hey, when you die, there'll be an eternal life away from suffering. If that's all the Bible gave us, it does give us that. But if that's all it gave us, without any sense of victory here and now and healing now and release from suffering now and release from sinful habits now, if it, all it gave us was only the final end, well, what would, that, what would that do to you? It would give you some sense of, okay, it'll be okay one day, but then what will that result to your posture now? Well, you'll, you'll stop praying. You'll stop fighting the good fight of the faith you'll just disengage you'll just step back and go you know what we just got to hold out you'll just lock yourself in your house and just wait until you die or wait until Jesus comes and be completely disengaged if that's all you had you would have hope but you would be neutralized in the present tense now let's say all we had was the other if all we had was the sense of it can all be over now, your suffering can be over now, your sinful tendencies can be over now, your sickness can be over right now, if that's all we had, well, then, then there's some curious things could happen to our spiritual walk. One, there would be no longing for this eternal glory. We'd be so caught up in present circumstances, there'd be no taste of the glory, of the beauty, of the eternality, of the sovereignty of God. We'd lose all of that. But we'd be so focused on the present tense, we'd be all about living our best lives now. Whereas in actual fact, to be honest, our best lives are in eternity. Like you need to know that. Absolutely it is. And we could be so caught in the present tense. And then when any disturbance comes, when things don't go according to plan, you'll be shipwrecked. Your faith will be shipwrecked. If that's all you had was the present tense victory but no future, you would be quite debilitated still currently. That's why the Bible gives us both. To keep us prayerfully engaged and fighting in the present tense, believing when we pray that God can and does intervene in our circumstances. There is after a little while does mean, can be, can mean now. But it absolutely also means at the same time, we pray and we expect God to intervene and change our circumstances. But ultimately, we long for that day when we will be with Him in eternity, minus suffering, minus sickness, minus any kind of sinfulness. That's supposed to be embedded in our hearts. So, what do we do? Pray like mad for your circumstances to change. Pray like mad for other people. That's exactly what we're doing right now, really believing God can and does intervene for our good. But don't lose sight of eternity and the glory that awaits us in eternity, where one day we will be completely restored. And on that note, so moving slowly through this verse. So after... After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself. Now look, look at these four words. Here's what we can expect after you've suffered. The God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let's have a look at those four words just real quick. So the first word, restore. Literally in the New Testament, Greek word there is used also, for example, in the Gospels, telling the story, for example, of the disciples who are on the boat. Remember that? And they got so much uh, fish and the nets are broken. Then we read, and they mended their nets. To restore means to fix, to mend. Something's broken. It'll be fixed. 
God will himself restore, mend you. And isn't that some encouragement? Because I know for a lot of people right now, you feel broken, like not working properly, like not yourself, and, and just wondering, like, will I ever be myself again? Well, that's exactly what this is saying. No, after you have suffered a little while, God himself, the God of all grace, will restore you, fix Men, that's why I think there is a present tense application here. He will mend you. Or things that are broken in your life due to perhaps the world around you or due to the opposition from the enemy or pandemics. Like maybe your nets have been broken too, your source of income. God of all grace will restore, will fix he restores. He's a restorer. So he restores, then confirms. Confirms the idea there is kind of like think of concrete, wet concrete, and then it sets, hardens. He will harden you. So you'll come out of it harder, stronger, more solid, firmer in your faith. It's like he's going to inject into you just liquid concrete that's going to set Harden you. Strengthen you. Similar. But this idea of muscles and feeling stronger, like able to do more. Not just endure more, but do more. And then lastly, establish you. Create a solid, it's the word for foundation. The house built on the rock. You can notice there's some slight differences there that are Little nuances that are beautiful, but really they're four words that are quite similar. And again, I think that's deliberate for a couple of reasons. One, when you get really excited about something, when you're really blown away by something, you might do this too. For example, you watch a movie and it's like amazing. Somebody asks you, how is that movie? You would go, it's amazing, incredible, just genius, brilliant piece of work. Four different words, very similar, but really it's just because you can't, quite express just how incredible it is that's happening here you do not we do not realize just how incredible the after you have suffered but is what is promised after you have suffered it's kind of like it's this cumulative effect as you read these words restore confirm strengthen establish you Basically, in other words, what it's saying is after you have suffered, God is going to come and make everything right. He'll make it right and leave you stronger than ever. How's that? He'll make it right. God will make it right and leave you stronger than ever. That's a summary of these four words. So after you have suffered for a little while, God of all grace will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. You know what I love about that is that one little word. Let's just go back a little bit. God will himself. He is going to do this personally. Let's just imagine here a little bit. I think we're meant to with these passages. Just take each word and savor it carefully. And I love this word. God is going to do this restoring, confirming, strengthening, establishing personally. In other words, he's not going to delegate it to some angels. You know, because let's be honest, like right now in the world, there's a heck of a lot of restoring needed and confirming and strengthening and establishing. And it's not like God's up there going, well, man, this is too much. I need to delegate this. And he calls his angels. You two handle surnames A to C. You two handle surnames D to F. And you guys handle... M and there's a, you know, the just M is a thousand M, you know, you guys, he's not going to like delegate it to all of the angels. No, God himself. I mean, we're talking spiritual world and spiritual beings and I, you know, the, I mean, that was just a silly example, but God does send angels to minister to us too. That's true. But what he's talking about is no, God himself. He's not delegating this task to even to angelic beings. He's going to do it himself. 
And he's the master at it. He's the specialist. I mean, think about it again. Let's just, let's just imagine. Let's dwell on this word. I think this is worth dwelling on. Let's imagine you've got serious back issues and you have sought out the best specialist in the country. This is actually something I know something about myself. And recently, my sister had back surgery and literally found the best specialist who was going to do what she needed. But she had to wait like six months before she could see him, as is often the case with specialists. So literally, she spent like a couple months lying flat on her back, couldn't do anything, waiting to see this renowned specialist. Then the day came to go see him. Now imagine, this did not happen, but imagine, now you've waited to go see this specialist. You go in and the secretary is like, oh man, unfortunately today the doctor is out on a course and can't see you today, but don't worry, the, the partner who's just as good will help you, you know? Like how disappointed would you be? Listen, this verse saying, God himself will restore he's the master restorer that's who he is that's why he's called the god of all grace all grace to cover all brokenness all needs all kinds of suffering all grace he's got it all every tool at his disposal everything he needs to restore you harden you, strengthen you, and leave you standing stronger than you ever were before. He himself is going to do this for you. So how about that? As an encouraging word to help us persevere and endure in the midst of suffering. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And he can do this because to him is the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's spend some time in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, you inspired these words. We know that these words are your words, God. They are your words. And that you've given them to us, you've given your whole word to us as a gift. And you illuminate words to our hearts at special times when we need them. And Lord, we, we cry out, I cry out, as one of the pastors of this church, just our family here at Rosebank is hurting, Lord. Would you, Holy Spirit, take these words and illuminate them to our hearts? They're your words. Bring them to life, to literal life in our hearts. That we're not just mentally fortified for tomorrow or the next week, for whatever announcement comes tonight, but that actually in our heart of hearts, there is the settled knowledge of eternal glory for those who are in Christ Jesus. And I pray for that deposit, that golden deposit to be placed at the bottom of the hearts of everybody, Lord, especially those caught up in suffering. The knowledge that one day, after a little while, however long we have left on this earth, to be sure there's no more suffering, no more weeping, it's just glory. At the same time, Holy Spirit, only you can do this but deposit into our hearts that kind of faith to pray for our circumstances and to pray for others, to expect you, the God of all grace, to dispense that all grace into all of our brokenness, all of our sufferings, and to live lives with purpose, interceding for others, struggling for our faith, fighting the good fight of the faith daily. with victory. And we thank you, God, for 
the amazing stories we have heard, for the victory we have seen in so many ways. We praise you. We worship you. We honor your name. And to you belongs all dominion. We've seen your hand at work. We've also seen those continue in suffering and struggle. God, we do, we pray today for relief, for earthly, albeit temporary relief. And maybe church in this time of prayer, maybe you want to just spend a few minutes just praying for yourself, for those around you, for particular sources of suffering you might be going through. If you're not suffering, I know you know people who are, so pray for them. Lord, we bring before you all of those that we know that we love, that are suffering, that are sick right now, that are struggling to find beds, those that are grieving at this present moment whose hearts are torn, those especially for whom the wounds of grief are fresh. Oh God of all grace, would your peace come upon us? Fortify our faith, we pray, but intervene on behalf of those that we love. Rescue them. Amen.